take you to the springs, like these beautiful crystal clear springs in Florida to go swimming in these, you know, cold, but beautiful waters. And I would do that because I know the way there and it's worth seeing. So oftentimes I might just take a group of people and say, I'm going to start describing to you what this environment in the heavenly dimension looks like. And all you have to do is just see what I'm, what I'm describing. And then at some point, I'm just going to cut it off. And then your, your imagination, the eyes of your heart are going to show you the rest of the picture. And so, uh, you know, one of the ways that we do this uh, just to make it easy to start out with is, you know, we did it at the beginning of our interview today is I might just go, okay, everyone just imagine Jesus in the room, like your first impression, ask out loud. And, and the more I think, the more you talk to yourself out loud, the easier this gets. You're not crazy. You might look a little crazy, but if you, you can just mumble to yourself and go, okay, Lord, where are you? in this picture right now, if you're imagining the room that you're in and you just trust your very first impressions. Well, I think he's standing next to me, you know? And so if you're in a group of people and you're all imagining the Messiah in the room, then great questions that come from that are, okay, well, what is he doing? What is he saying? What does he look like? And people are going to, you know, have all of these like facets, almost like looking at a diamond with all of its different facets. And someone's going to say, well, he looks this way, or he looks this way. Or I hear him saying this, and another person saying, I hear him saying this. And that's just one way to do it, you know? And then we could maybe, I, you know, all the time, I might just pick a place that people enjoy being in that heavenly realm. I, there's a place I call the silver tree, which is this beautiful environment. And we'll all gather around the silver tree. And I'll just do it the same way I just mentioned. Just I'll describe the scene. And if you want to do one of these today, just so you know, I'm game. We, we can totally do it with anybody that's watching. It's a fun thing to do together. Whenever I've done these with Gil, we, we sometimes will do like an activation at the end where everyone's in the heavenly realm together. Um, you know, so we might imagine that silver tree and we'll be around that and we'll just explore what's going on in that, in that realm. But, you know, the more we encourage people to use the eyes of their heart and to use their imagination, the easier this gets. You know, you mentioned before, you know, using like new age terms and how that throws people. And whenever I say the word imagination, sometimes I know people are hearing that word and they're responding with fear because they're like, wait, the imagination, I feel like that's the thing that the scriptures say that's like deceitful above all things. You know, like it's just going to, and I know my imagination and my imagination has led me in the wrong direction many times, you know, and I get that. I get all of that. But the truth is the, the word imagination is a very young word. It hasn't been around for a long time. I and mean, we're talking like a thousand years, maybe 1500. It's not, the word imagination wasn't in existence, even when Jesus was walking the earth or when Paul was writing the epistles. They, had, they didn't have a word to describe an internal ability to see things that aren't necessarily in this mortal realm, which is all the imagination is. It's, you know, the image, imagine, imagination. So that's, it's just a muscle that we have to be able to see into other, into other realms. And if Paul had that word, I wonder if he would have written that first chapter of Ephesians just a little differently. I wonder if he would have said, I pray, instead of saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be illuminated so that you could see. I wonder if he would have said, I pray that your imagination would be illuminated. But the fact is he didn't have that word. For us today, it's, the, it's kind of the word that we understand for your ability to get those pictures. And so you have to use it. It's, it's pretty much the, the muscle God gave us to do it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So pe people hear that, like you said, and they get scared and then they want to you know, they want to make sure that they're not making this stuff up or am I just imagining yeah. it and creating some really good imaginations, but, or yeah. memories, but I mean, it's, it's essentially faith being able yeah. to see the things that are not as though they are uh, stepping out yeah. and operating in faith. You have to see it in the mind's yeah. eye, uh, you know, see, yeah. see all of it healings. I mean, you know, right. you know, say manifestation, you have to see something and birth it in the spirit, see it in the mind's eye and then confess it out, speak it out yeah. and engage it and walk in it and to see if right it's on. real. There's a lot of people having, uh, encounters within or leaving their body or just angels appearing to them in the dream state in different realms of consciousness. And yeah. uh, so there's this debate like, okay, are they really engaging angels or are they just making it up in their mind? 
some yeah. and even for me i'm like it's a lot harder not harder but it just takes more time for me to engage the trance state and i i like to do a lot of breath work and light incense yeah. and have different colors going you know there's a lot of things that i do to kind of go deep into the trance state yeah, some people right. instant you get better at it though some people instantly you can drop yeah. in um take a deep breath explore that breath and kind of travel on that and hear tones and frequencies there's so much that you can do to kind of engage that realm some people yeah. can do it just close their eyes and they're already there you know and yeah. i think you, pe people get uh, good at it but then it's like well did you make it up or did it really happen at yeah. the end of the day um whatever deep realms you've been at like you that encounter is real to you so whether you yeah. have encountered so and so your ancestors who who have come to you in the spirit realm in, in heaven or Moses or whoever it's like was it was that really Moses well you leave with the encounter like it really happened and then you respond and you live your life differently like it really yeah. happened and that it, it imparted something to you that's how powerful the mind is that's how powerful the imagination is that we can will these things to, to happen and we have to go into the dream yeah. state we have to go into the trance state and I, well, I use the word shaman a true shaman a true seer is one who's able to go into those realms and pull things out the, yeah. the, the the vision that you had that God has given you how did you manifest that how do is that what do I need to do why do I keep doing the same things over and over and nothing's changing there's different techniques and, and modalities and things that we can do to bring it out and manifest it and man it just gets so so interesting of the different levels that we can in, in, embrace the dream state on and um man so that's why like there's this thing of, of going within and having the inner experiences which I love are are, are amazing and they're just as real the bible says what is seen is temporal but what is unseen is eternal and it has eternal value right but i'm also i love to couple it with gazing at the stars and engaging right. heaven that way so there's a lot of people who have seen and, I, and i've interviewed a lot of spiritual people a lot of new agers yeah. and things like that i've had the conversations with them a lot of their stuff is internal like it's just in, but everything starts there, right? Everything starts yes. within and then the changing yeah. of the mind, the renewing of the mind that's internal. But um, yeah. I like to hear the stories about when people have physically seen things show up, man. Like uh, again, with the stars, like I didn't, yeah. it wasn't in the spirit. I didn't like see it in the spirit. Like I physically seen stars shifting and things going in and out of stars yeah. and, and other, I mean, not even just star, I'm talking about beings and weird yeah. stuff that'll blow your mind that i've physically seen right yeah, and um right. people have seen like moses and things like that have, that have appeared to them and and uh in, in 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 the hotel rooms and stuff like that um yeah. whether that's internal or external have you ever seen anything like that appeared i've had demons elemental yeah. spirits manifest physically yeah. shadow beings running through the room like crazy stuff have you ever had any of that stuff going where it yes. physically crosses <laughs> over? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, and, and just to get to that story, I mean, there's, there's a couple, but uh, one comes to mind. That's always a fun one to talk about, but I think that you're right that there, it, it does begin here internally, but, it, but there's a goal in mind here, right? I mean, there's a, there's a plan that God has that if we can start to connect the realms within us, eventually it's going to come out. I mean, like, that's the whole thing. It's going to start inside. And then that kind of like heaven and earth overlapping space is just going to expand. And the more it expands, the more we're going to see the angels ascending and descending and coming and going. Now, to me, just in my own journey, I, I connected the world of the angels with the world of nature and creation mm -hmm. um, a few years into this experience because every angel I met seemed to correspond to some part of nature. And I thought I was crazy. I, I did not have a grid for that. I was like, I feel like I'm off in La La Land until, yeah. I just, until I started reading, right? Until I started finding that there were so many people that we're just building on, on what the work that they've done in these centuries before us, right? But there are so many examples of everyone prior to maybe just 1600. Uh, so just the last 400 Paracelsus years. Paracelsus being years, one of them, maybe? Say that again. Paracelsus being one of them, maybe. Uh, I 
don't know. I don't know. Paracelsus. Okay. I didn't know if you had any. Okay. No, but there is, you know, there's, it seems, you know, if we're, if we're trusting the historians here that every single person prior to the, what they would call the scientific revolution that occurred right in the 1600s, everybody prior to that always connected the world that we're seeing out here with the angelic world, with the heavenly reality. And back St. Augustine uh, said, and this is like, when was he, like late 300 AD? He said, he did not think you could step on a blade of grass without touching an angel. You know, of course, Jesus talks to the wind. He talks to trees. He talks to water. Suggests his disciples should talk to mountains. Suggests if people stopped praising, rocks would start talking. And so he has this paradigm for creation is not inanimate objects but it is directly connected to this heavenly reality in the world of the angels. And so those scriptures, he makes fire or and he makes winds, his angels that's in the Psalms. So wind being yeah. personified as part of the angelic realm, stars are always connected to the angels. And then of course you've got the intangible things like virtues. So that was happening Spirits, to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I found this author, Owen Barfield that wrote this book called um, saving the appearances The subtitle was A Study in Idolatry. And if you don't know his name, don't feel bad. I'm not sure anybody really does, but he was one of the inklings along with C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And Lewis calls Barfield the wisest and best of my unofficial teachers. In fact, it was Barfield that brought Lewis to his Christian faith and ignited his imagination. So there's no Narnia if not, if it weren't yeah. for Barfield opening that world up to him. Lord of the Rings and all of this. You know it. You know it. All right. So long, I'm, getting, I'm winding it up here yeah. so I can tell. You're good. So I was experiencing the angelic realm as these aspects of nature, feeling like a total misfit until I realized that that was actually historically how everyone saw the angelic world. It's only since the scientific revolution that we separated the world of creation And now the angels are in this separate category that we almost think of them like heavenly butlers, you know, that they're just kind of up in heaven waiting to like do stuff for us, you know, but everybody prior to 1600 saw these worlds connected. This is John in Revelation. I saw an angel in the sun. Daniel, when he meets Gabriel, he meets Gabriel in the water as if he's part of that aspect Hmm. of nature. Anyway, all that to say, one angel that I got to know well was named Marshall. And I always saw him in thunderstorms. And I was living in South Carolina at the time. You always get a really good afternoon thunderstorm. I got to know Marshall well. I would see him like towering in those thunderstorm clouds. He was a ton of fun to get to know. He was aggressive in the sense that if I needed angelic help, like like an active defense, I would I would I'd be like Marshall, I need your help here. You know, like he was the he was the fighter of all the angels that I had met, you know fitting for a thunderstorm-like being. And, and I would see him that way even in the spirit. He would be all blues and whites and kind of dark grays and blues and lightning and all those kinds of things. So I'm in Boston. Oh, no, not Boston. Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm doing a, a wedding. I'm, a, you know, the whatever you call it, the minister for this wedding. A good friend of mine's getting married. And they're getting married outdoors in a little courtyard right in downtown in the center of the city of Baltimore, Maryland. And the forecast for this summer day is it's wonderfully clear until about four or five o'clock when they expect strong thunderstorms. The wedding was for four uh, four or five o'clock. It was right during that time. So we're out there and we're setting up for the wedding and this, you know, you can see the sky starting to deteriorate. Like the thunderclouds are building, it's outdoors. Any good minister at this point has thought of a 10-minute ceremony in case it gets bad, right? Do you, do you, kiss her? Let's go, you know? Let's get to the reception. And so we're out there. It's getting dark. It's looking nasty. Everyone's seated. Here comes the wedding party. And, you know, everyone's lined up. The father brings the bride down. You know, he gives her away. We get to this point where the bride and groom are standing under, they're not Jewish, but they got married under one of those Jewish hoopas. You know what I'm talking about? The yeah. four poles, oh, yeah. like a canopy above them. So they're getting married under that. And I got to step back for a minute because they were having this time where there's some, some praise music going on. And as the music's going on, the wind starts to pick up 
and the groom is having to steady the hoopah pole with his hand because the wind's threatening to blow it over. And I feel the first drop of rain on my nose. And in that moment, I went, okay, I know an angel that personifies the storm. So I like picked up in the spirit, like the red emergency spirit phone, you know, and I was like, okay, Marshall, where are you? I need your help right now. And I see him come down out of the clouds and stand in front of me, all kind of cloudy and lightning and everything. And he just says, it's not going to rain. And I watch him fly up to one of the buildings, you know, because we're right in the middle of downtown Baltimore. And then I see his friends coming out of the storm clouds and they're perching themselves on all of like the edges of the buildings all around this courtyard. And it's like, they're looking down from 10 stories watching this wedding. Now this, I'm, I'm giving you the story exactly as it happened. This is not an exaggeration at all. Once that happened, the skies parted enough for the sun's rays to come down and illuminate the hoopa where the bride and groom were getting married. And we did the whole hour long ceremony. I got through the whole thing. I pronounced the man and wife. They kissed the bride, you know, or he kissed the bride, not they. He kissed the bride. Off they go. I'm dismissing the congregation to go to the reception. About half of the people have left this outdoor courtyard and the skies just open up. The rain just comes down in like a microburst. It just pours down. The wind comes rushing into that courtyard. The bride and groom had taken communion on this little fine china set and the, and the table is about to blow over with the china on it. So I'm trying to save the china when the hoopah finally blows over and one of the poles cracks me in the back of the head. <laughs> at which point, this is not an exaggeration, at which point I looked up to Marshall, the angel perched on the edge of the building and said out loud, because no one's paying attention to me, it's all rain. And I said, Really? And he goes, he looks down at me and goes, were you hurt? And I said, but did you die? (laughs) (laughs) No, I wasn't hurt. And then he just smiles at me and he's like, if you wanted more than an hour, you should have asked for more than an hour. (laughs) So so here I am seeing him. And of course the storm and, you know, got the China set, ran inside, had a great reception to the wedding. Never will forget that moment for as long as I live partly just because of the connection that you were just talking about. There's something that's happening on an inner way and it's starting to come out and it's affecting the outer world in really profound ways, you know? And to me, I think that's the fruit of uh, this whole mass of people that are participating in this phenomenon is that eventually it's going to come out. And it's going to transform things, uh, I, I suspect, radically. That's crazy, man. That's the, it's, that's it's the end awesome. of that story. It yeah. starts making sense, though, because like you're talking about nature and the elements and all this kind of stuff and how they're connected. Yeah. Tesla, knowing the stuff that he, he knew and, and stuff, he said, yeah. if you want to understand the universe, right, think in terms of energy and vibration, and this right. is a new thing that's blowing Christians off their socks right now. We've been right. studying this for years, but vibration, how everything is moving and how you're talking about. One of the biggest revelations for me was the the whole, you mentioned the rocks, right? Yeah. And I used to read that scripture as a young Christian and then think that if I don't praise God, that the rocks are going to open up and start praising them, singing worship songs, yeah. you know, but it's talking about like all creation already is praising him by their vibrational sound and uh, their vibrational tone and frequency. And it produces a sound like there's certain microphones that you can hold to the trees and hear the little drum beats. They're playing like a gym bait and the trees are making a drum noise. And then the earth has a resonance. Sounds like a bunch of birds, really high pitched tones in the rainforest and everything has a song. And when we join in with yeah. all of creation and, be, and we're conscious of it, I'm singing their song. Let's get into that. Yeah. You know, the, the, even the tone Om, where the monks would sit and sing this yeah. and chant Om. That's right. the sound or the song of the sun singing its worship song back to the father and when we are conscious of that i'm not only just one person singing i'm standing with 
all of creation on this earth, the stars, the realms, the angels yep. that are right now in the 24 elders singing, holy, holy, holy. I'm joining with them. And when yep. you embody that, you know that you're talking about encounter. I'm just talking about it. And I got chills all over me. Just understanding, mm. man, that again, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, man. And it's yeah. through sound, light, energy, vibration. We are uttermost. Our soul is singing forth, Abba, Father. Our hearts are singing. Everything is singing. And we, we join with that, man. Dude, it's so it's so powerful, bro. And um. Man, Tesla you know, had it right. And even with Tesla, yeah. though, there was a lot of stuff about him talking about engaging off world entities where you want to call them angels that live on other planets or star systems. And he claimed that he got info from these angels on how to in engage technology the way that he did. Yeah. And he did it in such a beautiful way, too. I mean, like there was something with Tesla, there was something so non mechanical about what he was developing. It was so, it, it was based on a participation with it. I think for Tesla, it didn't, he wasn't so interested in creating a bunch of machines. It was, he, he wanted to be with electricity. And so there's all those stories about him doing things with electricity that are very abnormal for us, you know, the way that it would course through him or that he could hold it. And yeah. it's because he's, he's relating to it, not as a, you know, not so much as an inanimate object, but as something with that frequency and vibration. And I don't, I don't know that there's a, it wouldn't be wrong in my view to even see the angelic world as a world of frequencies and vibrations and even experiencing, yeah. you know, like what you just mentioned, the, the stars speaking, you could interpret that as they're talking like humans talk. Mm -hmm. Or you could interpret that like, no, but they're making a sound. They're making a frequency. And that frequency, like in the case of Job 38 with the Pleiades, that frequency is coming from the Pleiades and it's hitting mankind, but it's a frequency of sweetness, which is why he says to Job, can you stop the Pleiades from influencing man with sweetness? Can you bind up the sweet influences of the Pleiades? And of course, historically, they were thought to be these seven sisters. You know, so we think of those Pleiades as, as these seven angelic sisters that are vibrating this energy to the earth and the effect on it, if you were to stand under it, whether you like it or not, is sweetness. You know, it just if you're aware of it, I think it would be more fun. But even <laughs> if you're not, it's still going to happen. You get you know? well, if you're aware of it, you get to engage with it. You know, yeah, instead exactly. of so, so the, the scripture talks about being blown away by every wind of doctrine and every sound. Yeah. And so y there's a lot of people who don't know who they are in Christ and don't know who they are in 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 the heavenly realms. And they're being blown around by every every, you know, whatever's on the news or CNN or catastrophe yeah. or the government. Right legalize this or whatever the case is right and so they're just being blown around around but there's even a hebrew word that talks about like we are the people who would not be just blown around by yeah. the elements or by the you know what i'm saying the constellations or whatever yeah. it gets really deep just understanding who we are in in conjunction with that bro and like i said yeah. you study it you engage that realm you give it time yeah. energy frequency you get to engage with it and, and yeah. mo most people are inter entertaining this stuff unaware and they don't even know. And that's OK. Yeah. That's OK. Yeah. It's not like if you don't if you're not into this stuff, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be watching this long into an episode <laughs> like this if you're not. Right. In it. But people are hungry. But we always hear those people who are like, oh, you'll find that out when you get to heaven. You're just asking too many questions. And all those people mm -hmm. is like, no, like my heart beats for this. I have the. um the mind to know i want to take it apart see how it works i've given my life over to understand how the spirit realm works who am i who are these beings we're talking about all this stuff and how does it affect me um we, we've been talking a lot about angels and glory and things like that which is amazing you know talking about electricity and vibration and the holy spirit moves through that electricity in our bodies and mm -hmm. we begin to tremble and vibrate as well um, but what about the dark side? Do you have yeah. any encounters? Are there any things to be careful of for you? Have you been possessed by demons? Have you had strongholds that are upon you and heaviness that is lifted? What does that look like in the realm that you're living in now? You know, I, I think working uh, 
you know, I mentioned to you that first time that I, that I got to really open my eyes and see into that heavenly dimension, the first two hours of that three hour journey was really working through stuff. I definitely saw a lot then, even since then, I found that when I'm in the spirit in the heavenly places, it's not a guarantee that I'm immediately going to be in like the throne room with the Lord. Sometimes you're going to get through some stuff on your way there. I, you know, there's a few times where I was like, Oh Lord, you know, something's going wrong. I'm seeing this dark figure. And instead of freaking out about it, I always felt like Jesus was just like, why don't you just imagine me with you right now? Like again, back to that basic, where are you in this picture? And I felt like whenever I was seeing something dark, it was because the Lord wanted to deal with it. Yeah. And so I would just like, again, wouldn't get scared. I, maybe it took a while to get to this place, but I was just like, I'm not going to freak out. I'm just going to invite the Lord into this experience and go, okay, Lord, I'm seeing this. Do you see that too? And if the Lord went, yeah, then I would say, what do you want to do about it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with it. What do you want to do about this thing? And oftentimes it would, there was, there was a confrontation there that the Lord wanted to have to, to take whatever that power or principality is, that dark thing in the, in the heavenly places and deal with it, to move it out of the way. There's still tons of times today where, I mean, I think if you walk through this life, right, you're going to experience heavy times. There's no way to get through this journey without, in other words, we're never going to walk through this world unopposed, <laughs> at least at least for the, the near future, maybe at some point. But I suspect even then God always has a story to tell. And stories need, you know, a protagonist and an antagonist. So <laughs> yeah, there's probably right, always man. going to be a holy war going on in some fashion. But then, like, but it, in, in, like, a perfect story, then you win them over at the end. Like, in the end, right. it's like you win over the bad guy. I mean, even look right. at the art that we have now with some of these television shows, like The Walking Dead and Breaking Bad. They s train up a villain who's like, I'm, yeah. and this villain will even kill families and sell drugs to children, and you hate them. But then right. something happens, and you see the humanity of this character, and then two episodes yeah. later, you're like, no, don't kill him. Wait. He's just like right. us, you know? Right. And so you're rooting for the bad guy at the end, man. And so like right. in a perfect story, like I hope that's what it's going to be like. No, I, I hear you that. Know? Yeah, no, I, 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 think that, I think that very thing. I mean, you know, God's got a plan. He's trying to reach everyone, everything, you know? So, yeah, I mean, even now, you know, there, there might be times of heaviness and it, and it easily could be because something is trying to oppose and, you know, it's not, you know, not all the angels are for us. A third of them fell, right? A third of them yeah. have decided to be against us. It's, it's comforting that there's more that are for us than are against us. But those ones that are against us make themselves known. Personally, I've just tried to, again, use the eyes of my heart, see what it is that's bothering me, and then invite the Lord into that picture yeah. and just be like, Jesus, this is what I see. Do you see this too? And if he's like, yeah, I see it too, then we're back to that question, what do you want to do about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had some experiences where I felt like I was in some kind of medieval battle where I'm being armored up, you know, and, and a weapon has been put in my hands. And it's like, you're going into battle with this entity. And it's never been scary. It's almost been exhilarating, you know, because I feel like I'm not powerless, you know, I'm not passive in this experience. Like I am in the spirit, seeing what's going on in the heavenly realms above me and then actively going there with the Messiah to deal with it, you know, and to, and to see the freedom happen or to get whatever is trying to hang on us off. One example recently that just happened last week, we were, um, I just got done with a conference in Nashville and my whole family got to go, which made my whole day, right? I mean, I was the happiest person in the whole world. My, my wife and my kids were with me. My kids were helping. My wife was speaking. I was like, I, I just couldn't be happier. We left Nashville. And the very next day, my daughter spiked a fever, mm. like a really high fever. And I'm going to be honest, we were a little scared. Um, you know, my wife is a pharmacist background. That was her trade. Um, so she's got some medical expertise. And I could tell she was nervous and that made me nervous. 
And the fact that we were just playing in a lake in Nashville, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what did we pick up in that water? You know, your mind, I, I'm yeah. human, just like everybody else. You go to like the worst case scenarios, you know, which is not great. I'm working on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm working on it. But anyway, we're worried. And I, and my, my daughter is, we're in my parents' house in Charlotte. We just left Nashville, drove to see them. And my daughter is flat on the couch, not moving, like, just like she is wiped out. And I went down there and I said, and I, you know, my daughter's name is Isabel. I said, Isabel, let's go to heaven. Let's go talk to Jesus and see what's going on. And because I was worried, um, you know, you just, all you have to do is Google, you know, like, what can you pick up playing in a lake that could spike a fever? And as a parent, you are right off the bat, like in the danger zone, you know? And, and so I was like, let's go to heaven. Let's talk to Jesus. We did that. I see this angel. And again, I feel like I can say this on your show because I'm pretty sure no one's going to think we're that crazy at this point, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I see this angel that looks like a tiger. I mean, like he is like, like a tiger, but he's walking upright like a human. And he's clearly some kind of angelic spirit and he looks fierce and he just looks at me and he goes, do you want me to stand next to your daughter and defend her? And I was like, yes, please. That is exactly what I'm looking for here. And so he walks over to where she is laying on the couch and he's like in, and now he looks like an actual tiger and like a tiger would, he just lays himself, himself out under, you know, right at the foot of the couch on the floor, like a tiger would stretch out to lay down. And he gave me this sense, like something's coming after her and I'm going to scare it away. So kid you not, she was running about 103 fever. The next morning she had nothing. And she was off the couch running around, playing around with the grandparents. And I thought to myself, like another example of there's something going on that's dark, that's trying to manifest itself. And it is, it's influencing the outside world in the form of sickness. And then here comes this angel that's like, I am ready to come in here and defend and to take care of some of this stuff. So long story short to say, yeah. We experience, we experience the battle, Warfare. I feel like, yeah. you know, but it's, it's almost exhilarating. I, I feel like to know that we're not passive, you know, like we've, we've got something here, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the battle is not mine, but the battle belongs yeah. to the Lord. Um, just the way that our interaction uh, with the angels, with the vibrations, with the spirits, with the elements in, in, in our interaction, knowing that the sovereignty of God. That yeah. he he orchestrates everything. There's nothing that gets past his mind. Oh, he got into that. He's like, okay, we're gonna make a lesson out of this. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. play in those realms. Well, you can. We're gonna make a lesson out of it, and I'm gonna teach you. And if you don't get the lesson, if you don't learn, you're gonna have to keep taking that test over and over, and keep messing with those people, keep letting bad people speak into your life, whatever that lesson is that you're going through. And God yeah. orchestrates that, and 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 He allows. And this is the sovereignty of God. He allows those other entities that we don't even got to call them good or evil. They just they have a they have a function that they have to do in order for you to get the lesson and for you to walk in the fullness of your destiny. And yeah. if if you don't if you don't do that, you're, you're not going to experience. It, you're not going to encounter. He's not going to send the angel of love and mercy to uh, teach you about the importance of you know not doing this or whatever like he he allows those darker spirits or what we would call maybe even demons or a thorn in the flesh as paul would call them a uh, messenger yeah. of satan as it was called so right. but the thing about it is, is submit yourselves to god resist yeah. the devil and he will flee make sure yeah. that in every area of your life you're submitted to god in every area, your mind, your will, your emotions, your finances, make sure you're not gossiping and backbiting, which the Lord hates more than anything. Right. So make sure that you're submitted on every level and whatever come, come what may. God has a lesson in a, in a plan in it all for you. And if you're submitted to God, there's nothing to fear and we yeah. embrace it with open arms. And so with that, my relationship with my past demons, demonic possession and heartache and the dark night of the soul my relationship has changed yeah. i'm thankful 
I'm not thankful yeah. for the demons, like the Lord used them. Okay, kudos, whatever. But I'm thankful that the Lord allowed me to experience that. That allowed me to go through that stuff because without it, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't have the natural empathy for people who are going through similar situations that just it just pours out of me. This is why I do what I do, because I've been through that and I and I can I, I know their story, you know. And so just the way that this all works together, nothing gets past the father, no demons, no angels. Um He's it, the earth, every, everything is his. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, and and this is covered under the fullness, man. This spiritual warfare, spiritual yeah. battle, it exists for a reason. But there's ways to overcome, you know, because it's like every it it, it it places this weird duality if we don't look at it like God's sovereign as like the devil is stronger than God, or maybe mm-hmm. the devil might win, or he thinks he might win. Come on, he's a created entity. Right. He yeah. thinks he might win. He exists. I don't think that the devil is God's enemy. I think mm. He's our enemy. Yeah, I think he's our enemy. He's, he tempts us and shows up. And but and, yeah. and it all works. This we're getting deep. And I'm writing a book on, yeah. on this, but uh, um, it all works together. Like it gets you ready for Christhood to, to, to get you ready for your journey as the Satan appeared to Jesus and Jesus. Yeah overcame him with the word and he tempted he was tempted on every every side you know and and he he withstood the enemy and so we mm-hmm. we must withstand him as well on on every side and so it's a but understanding that you're not a victim anymore yeah. it's all part of the game understanding the father and his will for your life and again like you said Jesus where are you in this man right. I need you I need to see you I've been looking at other things I need to see you where are you and let him, because he said, I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. So he's right. with you in all of it. And it's just that the balance of everything for every pot, there, there would, there's a contrast. What do you, who are you to, to be able to talk about the, the glorious, the marvelous light of the gospel, the mar- marvelous light of Jesus Christ, if you've not been into the pit of utter darkness? You don't know the contrast. Those who have been forgiven much, they love yeah. much. And there's yeah. so many people out there who have who have stories and and I just man just to see God moving and working in their lives is so beautiful, man. So you you've had a dark night of the soul experience. Couple, I had Couple. one that was like demon possession. The devil's got his hand on my mind, trying to take it from me. I'm seeing spirits, can't breathe, just going schizophrenic, and that was very scary. That was like my really turn around, come to Jesus moment. But even on this side of the cross, like. I've had some dark nights of friends and family abandoning, you know what I'm saying, abandoning you and yeah. people who looked up to you as a, a successful minister and somebody who encourages them. And now they call you a devil worshiper. Like we're talking about, like when that happened, that was scary. Like, cause I was somebody in the church realm and now I'm not just a nobody. I'm a devil worshiper. I'm this, I'm that, I'm a new ager. Uh, God hates me. I'm leading people to hell. And it's like, hold on. No, this yeah. isn't. So that right there, um, man, it was hard. The pendulum of knowing who I was um, and where God was leading me to with the stars. And the Christians don't want to hear about that, you know. And, okay, right. and I'm in it now. Okay, now I'm out of it. And so that going back and forth and back and forth like a lot of people experience, it'll drive you mad, you know. And so right. definitely, man. How about you? Yeah, you know, I it, it, you mentioned it. It just made me wonder if this is just like par for the course, people going through this wilderness like experience because there's something refining in it about character yep. and maybe about empathy yep. Um, yep. that you come out of it. Like you said, you are willing to look at other people really differently because of what you've experienced. It, personally, I think when God got a hold of me when I was in college, this is prior to even understanding any kind of a heavenly reality but just being introduced to the Holy Spirit as a, as a Baptist campus leader at the College of Charleston <laughs> and, and going through six months of seeing miracles and prophecy and all kinds of Holy Spirit interaction. And then it, it's like it turned off like a faucet. And the people around me at that time thought that I had a mental disorder. Yeah. Oh, because, yeah. They because I was. Do. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. Yeah, because <laughs> I was I was really up high with the Lord, and then it just you came down into this desert, and it was like God was talking every day so clearly, and then it just all turned off, 
And I tried to understand those experiences, but it was 11 years later that he opened up, you know, this heavenly dimension in that prayer time that I didn't see coming. And the first thing that I saw then in that prayer time was me holding on to prison bars and Jesus on the other side of the prison bars holding a key. And I spent the first two hours of that journey getting out of that prison. And a lot of it was from the traumatic experience of really being driven into that spiritual wilderness and not trusting God anymore. And just being like, I I feel like you want to give me good things, but I don't trust you Yeah. because you're just going to take them away. And then I'm going to like go down into the dumps and people are going to tell me I'm bipolar. Yeah. You know, and so I really had to work through that. I'll tell you the, the beautiful part of that was the end of that experience was Jesus, you know, of course, getting me out of that prison and essentially saying, you know, what I did with you in college when I opened all this stuff up to you. He's like, you know, I, I want to do that and so much more, but I never want you to think that it's because you've earned it. Yeah. And he said in college, you thought that what was happening to you was happening to you because you were a good candidate for it, because there was something about your life that made me think it was a good idea just to blow my Holy Spirit on you and on that group of students there. And he was like, what I want to do with you, I want to last for a lifetime, but it will never last for a lifetime unless you understand that it is about mercy, that it's not because you've earned it, because if you think you've earned it and I open up the heavens to you, then the moment that you screw something up, you're going to think that you don't have the access anymore. And he's like, because you'll think I earned it. So now I can unearn it, you know? It's my good behavior that got me in. So it's my bad behavior that's going to kick me out. And so his whole point was, I just want you to know that you're going to come here as often as you want to. And it's never going to be because you've done anything. It's just going to be because of an act of mercy. And that gave me like the healing to trust again, to know that he's been refining something deep in a character. sense, And that was the whole purpose for that dark night of the soul spiritual wilderness experience. And I still have to relearn that lesson. I still, I still have to, I mean, I still, it's like my arch nemesis. I think the good things that happened to me happened to me because I've earned them somehow. And, uh, but you know, the Lord's always there to remind me, you know, like I remember one time he was like, so tell me what you were doing. That was so good. That made me think that I should open up the heavenly dimension to you. And I would be like, uh, nothing. And he goes, right. (laughs) So if you didn't do anything for me to think it was a good idea, you can't do anything for me to think it was a bad idea. It's good. It's it's not based on what you've done or what you're doing. It's just based on an act of mercy that you and that's trustable, right? Because it doesn't have anything to do with me. So, I mean, just as an aside here, I tell people all the time, an A plus on your God report card, is not earning you a trip to heaven any more than an F minus can keep you out. I mean, it's true that our decisions have really strong natural consequences to them. If you do heroin, you're probably going to get addicted. You're probably going to lose your job. You're probably going to lose your family if you keep doing it. But you can bring a heroin addict to someone that's doing this heaven stuff. And we can take that heroin addict into the heavens And that heroin addict is not going to meet a frowning father sitting on the throne. That's like, man, we expected more out of you. We are so disappointed. I can't, you're going to have to clean up your life before you attempt to come back here in the spirit. Like that never happens. You bring the heroin addict to the Lord in the spirit. That person sees a smiling father that's got these open arms. That was like, we were waiting for you. We were waiting for you to come here to the throne room. And that person can walk their way right up to the father without having done anything to earn it. That to me is a, that's, that's a miracle we're celebrating, but I don't think I would have got that if not for that dark night of the soul. Man, the, um, the goodness of God, uh, leads all men unto repentance and just to let him know how good he is like the gospel. And it was just and this, this was imparted to me by listening to like a Christian universalist is, um, but he was talking about how it made me, it's like a dualism or whatever, something like the gospel was outside or it's like Christ will die for you or Christ, mm-hmm. God will forgive you versus he's like, no, no, no. Yeah. God has already forgiven you. It's our job just to let people know. 
We need to tell them that what we, as we declare the gospel, we're declaring what is already done. God's not yeah. going to change his mind. It's already happened. So it moves from, from us just hoping that God, let's pray, man, let's hope he forgives you and have an encounter and he doesn't forgive right. you. Like, come on, that's crazy. Yeah. He's already done it for all yeah. of us. And so it's the free gift of grace, justification through, by grace through faith of believing in what he's already done. That's, yeah. that's our entry. That's what, that's how we engage in all of this stuff we've been talking about. That's how it opens up that alone. It's not like we have really cool stories, right? And people, yeah. we love to hear speakers with these great stories, but just talking about how, like we're talking about how God qualifies the called. And so some people would hear these stories and they would get upset. They were like, you know, like, I don't have that story. Like I've never done drugs. I've never done witchcraft. I've never been this. I've never done that. And they kind of feel like left out, like they're unqualified because they don't have these grandiose testimonies and things. And so it just goes to show just to let people know that you don't have to, you don't yeah. have to, we've caused a lot of havoc in our own lives and, and, and experienced things and realms that, you know, weren't good. And we we were excited to tell the story because we lived to talk about it and we've seen mm. heaven and we lived to talk about it. We did not die. Right. So this is engageable for everyone out there. If you desire it, it's there for you. I talk about all the time, just the way the universe operates, man, is whatever you're looking for, you're going to find it. Whatever you yeah. focus on, whether if you're looking for the bad in people, you're going to find it. If you're looking for the bad in me, the fault, and uh, hey that doesn't line up with scripture or what you you can whatever you hold a magnifying glass to you're going to be able to find it with everybody with you chris with karina yeah. with all of these people but i tell you show me your favorite like i've studied so much i'm like show me your favorite preacher who who doesn't have any you know reproach and i guarantee we can find some stuff on them because everybody oh, yeah. has something, man, that is a little bit off. There's nobody that has the fullness of it all who's teaching it and, and preaching it, man. But it's just there. It's for everybody to engage with with peace, love and understanding. Um, I got a couple more questions for you, bro. Um, yeah. If you don't want to answer any of this stuff or you don't want to get into it, my audience is open for whatever. We've heard some crazy yeah. stuff on here. Um, the truth will set you free. So I, right. I you know with the truth in Christ, but I want to ask you a couple more questions and somebody keeps asking this and, and, and they're going on every platform asking this question. So I want to ask you, I've done, right. some, I've done some studies in, in the spiritual world and there's a thing, there's things that are called tulpas, right? Tulpas mm -hmm. are, you can create these entities by thinking about them, by speaking to them. Essentially they would, they would cross over into the Bible as, uh, strongholds as demonic strongholds that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And these are the demons. These are the entities that yeah. sit in the mind and in the belief system of an individual that come off as ungodly beliefs. But so there, and there's this notion there, but there's a question that keeps coming up from, I think it's Michelle or Michi and then Rick. And they're asking the same question. Have you ever created an entity, whether it was a good one or a bad one, does that even make sense? Does it enter the conversation of something that you, I know we, we create it as we speak it, right? And yeah. and we're, we're creating all types of either havoc upon our lives and, and there's demons that are loosed, maybe even created. I don't know that as we speak this stuff up, we're creating these dimensions, good and bad. But what is your experience or is that something that you'd be willing to talk about? Absolutely. I, I'll take it. I'll take it the good way because I'm, I'm like a hundred percent sure I've done it the bad way and not known it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm sure that's come with, with human nature. I bet everyone has experienced that where we have created, in other words, there was probably something that was probable and we made it reality just because it's, we focused on it for so long. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure that that's possible. Yeah to do it in a negative way, totally. in a positive way, I would just say, you know, I, I remember having this conversation. There's, there's one angel I probably know better than all the others. I just, you know, like, it's like, um, I liken it to St. Patrick. He had this angel Victoricus that he even called Victor for short because they knew each other so well. So it said, Patrick met with Victor, like a man meets with his friend. So there's an angel that I, that I, I feel like I've come to know well. And I know him by the name Brennan, which is just the old Gaelic form of the name Brendan that we're all familiar with. So one day I'm walking in the park and I'm talking to this angel Brennan, and I 
could not for the life of me figure out why he wastes his time with me. <laughs> so I was like, don't you have someone better to hang out with? I mean, like, again, like you're talking about our lives in, in at least one area, probably more look like a dumpster fire. Sometimes it's just a mess, you know, and we're all getting our junk worked out. And I just, it was one of those days I was feeling like, you know, surely, you know, someone that does this better than I do. Like, you know, someone that understands how to cooperate with your angelic realm more than I do. Maybe you should go hang out with them, you know? And so I'm asking him, like, what do you get out of this? Like, I feel like I benefit from you being in my life. And this reality opened up to me. What in the world do you get out of this? He had one word for an answer. Existence. And I thought, wow, I did not know that was the, that was what I was bringing to the table. And if you think about this, this fits the creation story, I think, beautifully. If you can imagine that God empowered all the aspects of creation, gave it life, gave it spirit, he inspirited all these aspects when he's saying, let there be light and let there be the waters and let there be the bodies in the heavens and let there be the things on the ground, you know, on and on and on. It's like he's giving power away for all of creation to be alive and to contribute to the story. It feels like the thing that God never gave away was the statement of being, which is what he says his name is to Moses. When Moses says, who am I going to say sends me? Yeah. And he said, tell them, I will be that which I will be. Like that's the, the tetragrammaton, the mm -hmm. YHWH of God's name. I will be that which I will be. It's a statement of being or which we would interpret as existence. There must be so much creative power inside of us that what we're looking at is what is becoming reality. And so I have no doubt that Brendan exists, whether or not I see Brendan or not. But it did seem like the fact that I could focus on him using the eyes of my heart, you know, using that imagination, the pineal gland, all that working together, that the very fact of doing that was bringing that angelic spirit into reality even more. I never thought in a million years that's what I was bringing to the table. But I never looked at the relationship the same way again. I thought, yeah, you're incredible. You're powerful. You're this angelic spirit. I'm just trying to like get through life and not freak out about everything. And, you know, what, what do you get out of this relationship? And he says, existence. Uh, so I, I don't know if that was the answer. No, that that's, that's really good, man, for, asking, sure. But sure. for sure. For yeah. sure, man. Um, that's so weird because like when you do it in the demonic, I've been yeah. on both sides. Um, when you try to make packs with demons, they want uh, things on the earth. They want trinkets. They want idols, formulated idols, to just to remind you that they're here. Um, they want blood. They want all of these these unrighteous things. A lot yeah. of times they want a piece of your mind, and they don't tell you that. They want to mm -hmm. live in your mind. And when you have demonic, evil entities that have ulterior motives that live in the minds of men, that's where we get into schizophrenia. We get into all types of crazy, um, you know, yeah. ailments that are going on with the mind. And that's what happened to me. I'm making packs with these demons and I didn't know that they were going to be talking to me in yeah. wee hours of the moment and speaking foreign languages and just crazy stuff that I couldn't yeah. control, which scared me. Um, but it's almost like, you know, so it's like they want to prove that they exist, you know, and so the, the demons would cause havoc and do bad things. But then the angels, on the other hand, you know, they're the, the Bible says that the earth, that, that God is going to and fro throughout the earth, seeing who he can get to, to, to listen to him, to, to communicate, yeah. to spend time with him. Right. And so they just yeah. want to be recognized. And there's just so much deep um, stuff there when you go about whatever you seek, whatever it becomes real, even if it's just to you, yeah. but it is real. And then again, when it's like, when you have to, okay, again, like, am I going crazy? I mean, that's the first thing everybody's asking, right? Am I going right. crazy? Everyone's going to ask this that you got to, who do I talk to about lights appearing to me in my backyard as I pray? You know what I'm saying? I right. talk to my pastor, right. 
you know, talk to my wife. Like, it's scary. You don't know who to talk to. You just read the Bible and see where they did it in the Bible. And lights appeared and chariots of fire and the Merkabah and the char you know, right. chariots and angels and things. And so it, it lets you feel, okay, I'm trying to line my life up to, to the word. So, yes. you know, a lot of people, man. So for us just to have this conversation, uh, it, it helps people just to let them know that, first of all, you're not alone. And I wish I had... I wish I had access to conversations like this when I was going through this stuff, you know, and going mad and or whatever. Oh, yeah. The case is, you know? Yeah. That would have helped a lot. But there's a lot of people, even as you're sharing about your, your dark night and all of the things you've experienced and encounter, I'm reading the chat here and people are just saying how, you know, you're speaking their story. You're like reading their book, singing their song. Cause there's like, it's, it's ministering to them. And so that was something beautiful there because in church we would always like, I, used to, I did gospel rap for years and I would share my story about how God pulled me out of witchcraft and all that. And I would, I've spoken hundreds of churches and, um, when I begin to speak about some of the deeper things where I would be against some of the stuff going on in the church and I would speak about it, I would see people's eyes light up like, Oh, I feel the same way, but nobody is, um, vocalizing this feeling. And I'm saying it for the first time and there's no pastors, there's nobody teaching on this stuff. And so you're in like un uncharted territory. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the clergy would usually get upset and they hey, get this guy. What's he talking about? But the people's eyes would light up. And that was something I kept with me to even now. It's like speak your truth in auth authenticity and because it, mm -hmm. it's your truth. Um, and then people will relate to it except and, instead of like. What if you were just being quiet? What if you didn't answer that question, right? What if you say, no, that's a, you know, it's going to, uh, controversy, people are going to want scripture references, going to, I got to do <laughs> teachings and, you know, all this kind of stuff on it to kind of give them the blueprint. And you just, yeah. just avoided that. But when people are going through it, they're like, wow, I feel the same way. I'm having dreams. I'm seeing the same things in the spirit. I'm seeing the same lights in the sky when I pray, when I yeah. meditate, I feel like things are watching me but they're good. They're not bad. Who are they? Are they angels? And so for us to have this conversation, bro, it, it mm -hmm. I want to ask you about Solomon, but just to tie this in with Solomon, going back to uh, Solomon dealing with Bathsheba, the queen of the South, which the Bible says in Matthew that will rise again in judgment against this generation. So mm -hmm. I wanted to look up, what did that mean? Well, it goes back to Solomon having this standoff, standoff with uh, the queen of the South, which was the Queen Sheba, who was persecuting yeah. the prophets of God and was against Yahweh. And she heard about Solomon and all his wisdom and splendor. And they had this standoff. You get you and your best people, come have a meeting with me and my best people. And we're going to prove that the God of Israel doesn't exist or he is a lesser God than the ones we serve. Yeah. So they devise all these questions. They get up and they come to have this meeting at this helm. Uh, and so she has all these questions that she asked Solomon and she knew that she would debunk them. And it's just the spirits in the earth right now. Um, and she would debunk them. And he answered every single one of her questions, blew her mind. But in the midst of that conversation, as he was intentional, it says that the evil spirit left her because he answered all of those all of those questions and so that brings yeah. us to the idea and the point that even through conversation even through confession and just talking about this stuff that spirits and ungodly beliefs beliefs are being released off of people mm -hmm. and are being cast out of people just through conversation man solomon the power of life and death being in the tongue what do you have to say about Solomon in your studies and what does that mean to you? For me, the Testament Sol of Solomon was huge. I don't know if you've read that, but what, what does Solomon mean to you in this realm of we have authority over spirits and the angels, even the angels are over certain legions of demons and they help to bind and loose the spirits as well. What, what are some of your info on that? Well, I just, uh, first, what you just said, I'd never thought about that way, but um, that was beautiful. Like, I just, I, I, I don't think I'd ever thought about the conversations and the answering of questions being directly responsible for freedom from, from yeah, actual deliverance. I'd never thought about that. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just, I'm in a moment right now where I'm really I'm like, wow. Thank you, Lord. That's, Amen. That is a great way to consider even something as simple as the answering of questions. Yeah. You know, in, in Matthew, it says that that spirit would rise again. We're talking about spirits again, right? All these spirits right. and who who are yeah. they? What are they? And it says that that spirit will rise again in judgment 
against this generation. This is the colleges. This is people trying to disprove God. This is yeah. people laughing in the face. We're, spirits don't die. People die. Right. Oh, spirits yeah. don't yeah. die. You know, bodies yeah. die. But we, the same spirits that we're contending with now, Jesus dealt with them. The same spirits Jesus yeah. dealt with, Moses dealt with. It's just a recycling yeah. of these, of these, the embodiment of these yeah. archetypes of these spirits. Yeah. You know, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm loving your, you know, your statement here so much, partly because I, I love words. <laughs> like I really love words. I love them because, um, you know, we live our lives today. So prosaically, we're really missing a poetic element. Now you're probably not knowing the little bit that I know about you and your art and your music you're probably living with more poetry than 99% of people are living with. But the fact is scientific revolution really took the power of our words away because we started living just in this kind of mechanical mode of, of, of thinking of speech and thinking of words. Whereas, you know, 98% of human history before the 1600s knew that words, what they were really doing is they were traveling across the veil. And so when you were talking, you weren't just talking to like lifeless objects. You were talking past this kind of cosmic, cosmic veil into a heavenly reality. And then, of course, you were bringing something back. Like that was what a word was, you know. Mm. Um, you know, again, all those astronomical origins to things like understand, you know, or the word disaster, which literally means the stars are against us, you know. <laughs> you know dis against aster star, you know, the, the stars are against us. And so, you know, all of these words came from a communication, not just with the objects, but what was behind the objects, like on the other side of a very thin cosmic veil. Yeah. And so when I'm thinking now in this conversation, you know, this is, this is a topic I really like to talk about just because I want to, I want to re-empower words, but it's almost like we need to bring a poetic element back into life to balance out this mechanical language that we've all become accustomed with. And, you know, just looking at the scriptures themselves, they're a little over 50% narrative story. Then they're about 33, 34% poetry. And then the remaining, whatever, whatever the teen percent, 13, 14% is prose, like Paul explaining something in Romans or in first Corinthians, you know, or, or what I'm doing right now, you know, like that's prose. So the Bible itself seems to think there should be less emphasis on that and more emphasis on the kind of language that really travels past the veil and can bring something back. And historians, again, like Owen Barfield, who we mentioned earlier, they kind of argue that that's what defines good poetry. It's language that actually crosses the veil and communicates with a spiritual heavenly reality. And you feel it unconsciously even when you're reading good poetry or hearing good poetry in the form of music or whatever. So I'm, again, I'm just like, I, I'm still reeling over your statement because I, I'm thinking, man, that's just, it's a beautiful way to think of language that the words themselves, that that's even part of what God is restoring to us. So that maybe one day that creative power that you mentioned being in the tongue, that we really do have life and death in the power of the tongue, that for us to again, be, so much more fully human in the way that Jesus was so much more fully human that we would regain the power of speech itself. And maybe we are, and we're unconsciously doing it without even realizing that's what's happening. Yeah. You know? I think, I think the prophetic explores that. Right. And so as we yeah. are able to hear God speaking in the spirit and we're able to see uh, the gold within people. We see people through the lens of faith and see them how the father sees them, see them all. Mm -hmm. So whether you, so we're just talking about that uh, heroin addict, maybe or you mentioned yeah. of. And so we don't see them as a heroin addict. And so Jesus never seen the, the, the person who was ailing as a person who was, you know, less of a person. He's seen them. They he was able to see past that. And he understood the spirits that were, affecting that person or afflicting that person he knew how to speak yeah. to that but he's seen that person made well and so that's what we're supposed to do and so we see it and then we release it prophetically now this can be a download from god of god speaking uh words of knowledge about their childhood about their marriage situation and god just giving us these downloads 
but speaking prophetically comes as easy, easily as declaring the word of God or the word of truth over that person to see where they are now and to see them in faith, healed, restored, set free, more than conquerors, you know, financially free, not, you know, there's so many different scenarios. But as we speak it, we release it over that person as the truth and it, it, we impart it to them. It's been there the whole time. But they just yeah. need a prophet. They need a seer, someone who understands to be able to speak to them or to breathe upon them with the breath of life. Like Jesus breathed upon his disciples and they received the Holy Spirit to see it, yeah. speak it out, vocalize it. The Bible says prophesy to the wind. The wind is the breath. We yeah. speak, speak to them and pull it out of them. And in mid conversations, I know it's happened to you, but it happens to me. You listen to somebody preaching and they say one word and you just feel cut. You just the glory yeah. of God shows up. Everybody else is just listening. You're just right. like trying to hold it in like, oh, my God, I've been at little small Baptist churches. Right. And they yeah. there's not really a lot of charismatic or extravagant yeah. worship, but the dude's preaching and I'm like trying to keep it i want to cry i want to ball and wail mm -hmm. just because the inner work that god's doing in my heart and i'm trying to hold it in because these people are very conservative you know but that's the <laughs> power of the, the the word man of the spoken word mm -hmm. that it has the power to go forth and and cut down and de decipher the heart and to reveal the secrets of the heart and as we gate we yeah. it's the written word it's the living word it's the word of God. And it's the same word, the, the breath that animates all life that we're speaking, that God created everything with through the breath. And we're speaking that over people, releasing them. So you just got to renew the mind and change how you see people. See them yeah. like the Lord sees them. Right on. Speak it out, man. Release it. And even yesterday yeah. I had a session with a brother and I just remember seeing that in, in him, what the Lord told me and I spoke it out. Dreaming. Uh, yeah. I know we can go for we've got so much in common man that we could talk about one thing i want to touch on just to see i want to hear about the sound of these yeah. angels or the sound of the holy spirit or the sound of god who do you talk to and what do they sound like and i want to couple that with telepathic communication right the lord is the bible talks about a quickening in the spirit right he put, impresses something on you these downloads these visions but more so the audible voice it's like but you hear it within right i don't know that there's a difference between okay i was talking to the lord and he sounds like this and then the holy spirit sounds like this with that inner voice and then Jesus sounds like this. So you got God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and they all have different a different three-way conversation with you. And then there's the angels. What yeah. do they sound like? To me, and I'm just throwing this out there, it is yeah. a telepathic. It's a, it's an inward oh, knowing, yeah. a speaking. And yeah. the angels, I mean, it's the same thing. Like it's if, yeah. To me, it's the same. You just have to kind of understand the fruit of it and judge it. What is it like for you of deciphering the voices within? Yeah. And, you know, the way that you described it, I think is probably the way my wife would describe it. So she works in terms where she would say she has the impression yeah. of something. I might say I hear, she might say she has an impression. Now we both get to the exact same place with the exact same amount of detail, you know? So however the semantics is, we're probably all headed the direction. But for me personally, when I would get to know the angels, you know, again, I would be doing that in the spirit, using the eyes of my heart. So I would see them all differently. Consequently, I would hear them all differently. And it seemed to me that their personalities were coming through. Cause I mean, I, my category for angels was again, more of that heavenly Butler kind of thing. Like they're all these kind of cookie cutter, you know, they're all the same. They're sort of waiting in their white outfit mm -hmm. in heaven for us to say, we need something. Then they come and they help us, you know? But even early on, I was meeting angels that were like, some were so talkative and some were so quiet. And But when they did say something, it was really impactful, you know? And so I, I was meeting them in all different ways. I met angels that, you know, looked and sounded masculine. I met angels that looked and sounded feminine. Of course, I thought I was crazy when that happened until I found a reference in Zechariah about these feminine angels, these women with wings like a swan. Wow. that were carrying things, you know, it was pretty cool. Right. So, you know, there's, you know, I, I walked through all of that learning them as I went and learning their personalities. So to me, they did sound in a way that reflected more or less who they were. 
And that was true, I think, even when I would, I would be in heaven and I would be talking to the Father. Like the Father's presence to me was different than Messiah's presence, you know? And so the voice was different. I don't know if it was lower and older. I don't know, you know, if that was just a given. But you know, there, was a, there was a change, you know, one that I could sense. These days, I mean, it's common for me, like when I wake up in the morning, I'm already kind of like tuning in. And I'm like, okay, where am I? There. I know where I am here. I'm like John, right? I'm on the Isle of Patmos. Well, I know I'm in my bed when I wake up in the morning, but where am I there also? Like, am I still in the same place I was yesterday? You know, is, is it still the same picture? What's going on? And then the next question is, who am I with? What angels are around me this morning? Is it the normal crew that I've come to know really well? Is it a different group? And sometimes I haven't even opened the eyes of my heart, but I am listening and I pick them up by their voice. You know, oh, that sounds like this angel. Oh, that sounds like Messiah. Oh, that sounds like this person, you know? And I don't know that it's even a sound yeah. as much as it is an impression. A vibration. Yeah, it's hitting me on more levels than acoustic, you know? Because I'm not hearing it with these ears. I'm not hearing it with my biological ears. I'm hearing it. If you have the eyes of your heart, I think you have the ears of your heart too, right? They're picking up something on a different level that I interpret as like the same way that I would interpret sounds and pitches and tones and, you know, uh, the, the tenor of someone's voice. And so I, you know, you're just, it's picking it up because there's some familiarity and some relationship there, but it isn't, it isn't coming through ears. You know, it is coming through an internal uh, communication. Um, I, to, maybe telepathic is the right word. I'm not sure what it would be called, but it's coming through the same system inside of me. So that inward it's, knowing. Yeah, it's the same system that I'm using when I'm in the spirit and in the heavenly places using the eyes of my heart. Does that help with that at all? Is that yeah. kind of where we were going? Yeah, yeah. I think it's this terminology as well. I mean, the Bible doesn't use telepathic. The Bible uses, yeah. you know, quickening. Quickening. There was yeah. a quickening in, this, in, in the spirit. So yeah. um, definitely, man. So... That's awesome. Um, shoot, let's see what else I had here. Um, someone asked a question. Um, it was Jesse Lee because early on you mentioned these different um, uh, theologies and things that you've come to about the Holy Spirit that were kind of outside of the box, and they was like, I, I can't go any further. I want to hear more about that." So Jesse Lee <laughs> is asking about that in the comments. All right, Jesse Lee, that's that's a that's a good question right there. Um, I, uh, I'm going to try to make this short because it could be a really long discussion, but in, in short, since I believe that we are in the transition between cosmic ages, if I look at the previous transitions historically, and it is astronomical, right? So every 2100 years, astronomically, we're moving from one age to the next, and we can watch how God moves us forward in our story. In those same periods. So when Adam is and Eve, when they're coming out of the garden because of the because of sin entering the picture, that astronomically corresponds to the age of Taurus. About 2100 years later, roughly, because it's not like a light switch, it doesn't flip on or off, you know, it's kind of a gradual change. God sends a transitionary by the name of Abraham. He comes on the scene, moves us into the age of Aries, which is why he finds a ram in the thicket instead of Isaac to sacrifice. And it's why just a few centuries after him, Moses is instituting this whole sacrificial system based on rams and lambs at Passover. 2,100 years later, Jesus comes on the scene, and that's when the age is in Pisces. And we, we just notice it by the spring equinox. What constellation is the spring equinox? What constellation is the sun rising in on the spring equinox. So Jesus moves us into Pisces. And of course, that's the fish. And so who does he call for disciples? Fishermen. Where does he get the coin for the tax? Fish, fish's mouth. Where does he find them after the resurrection? They're fishing. What's the first recorded symbol of Christianity? The fish, you know, yeah. so he's moving us into these ages. When those ages change, we tend to learn things about God's identity that we didn't know in the previous age which is totally scary because everyone would love to believe that God's identity, as far as we understand it, is static and unchanging, but it's not. 
And I don't think we will ever exhaust understanding who God is. So it's not like we've like learned all there is to, to learn. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he introduces God as a daddy. No one knew that. And that we take it for granted. But prior to that, I mean, Israel, from Abraham to Jesus, they, they um, stayed away from the idea of God as a dad because all of the pagan religions around them, their gods were procreative fathers. Like Baal, that was kind of the arch nemesis. They wanted no part in that. Yeah. So when Jesus tells his disciples when they're like, how, how should we pray? And he goes, here's how you ought to pray. Our daddy who's in heaven. Well, they're all doomed. They're in heresy right off the bat. You know, he's introducing something about God. We didn't know this familial nature of God. And then he's introducing himself as the son, which of course is the heresy that gets him killed. And then by the time he's done, he's introducing the Holy Spirit. And he's going, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, to this day, Jews, especially in Israel, do not believe Christians are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exactly. Because the identity of who we believe God to be changed so drastically that they were like, this is a different deity. This cannot be the same God. And that's, that's, a, that's a cosmic age change. When the ages change, the shifts are drastic. We've gotten a new commission every age. God gave one to Adam, gave one to Abraham, gave one through Jesus. We're right on the cusp. Well, of anywhere. Like if there's a team that could roll into like an open. Was that me or you? Uh, I think it was me. Yeah. <laughs> no, if, which means to me that if, if we're on the cusp of a new age, we're about to learn not only new things about our commission, that trump all the commissions we're given before, just like they have in every age, but we're probably going to even learn new things about God's identity. To me, that raised the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Because if we ask 30 people to describe the Holy Spirit, we're going to get 30 different answers. They asked me that like, two weeks ago on the stream, like, and they were serious, like, Hey, who, can you go into detail about the Holy spirit? And you usually would go to the, like, go to the Christian response. Then you're like, wait, which aspect? Oh my God. Like, where do we start? You know, it's like, let me just right. try, you know? Right. So all that to say, you know, it's, it's very unknown. Like we have a good bead on who the father is. We've got a decent bead on Messiah to Holy spirits, kind of like this strange third part of the Godhead that we don't quite understand. Now, all of this, I'm explaining it to you logically, but just so we know, I discovered it first via experiences in the spirit in the heavenly places. And then I had to ask the question, Lord, you're going to get me in a lot of trouble. So you better explain to me what I'm seeing. And so I spent years diving into why what I was seeing could possibly be true. So here we go. Everyone put on your crash theology helmet and your crash theology goggles, because this, you don't have to believe me. I'm just going to try to give it to you in a succinct way, scripturally and logically. If we have a Holy Father that has a Holy Son, what is the only logical remaining member of that family? And of course, if anyone says Holy Pet Dove or Strange Uncle that no one understands, you're not being honest with yourself. Holy Father, Holy Son, the only logical remaining member is a holy mother. Now, is there anything to back us up there? Well, scripturally speaking, the word for Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, and it is a feminine noun. Through and through, it's feminine. It even gets paired with feminine verbs. So as if to, you know, solidify the gender of the word spirit, in Hebrew. And if anyone's like, but in my Bible, in the New Testament, it's a he. It says the spirit of truth and he will come. So how did that happen? Well, it's got an easy explanation. In Hebrew, the word for spirit is feminine. That got translated into Greek. In Greek, the word for spirit is gender neutral. It's an it. Then that Greek got translated into Latin. And guess what? Latin has a word for spirit, but it's masculine. So that's when it took on the pronoun he, but that's not because that's the language it was written in. I personally believe every book in the canonized Bible was written in Hebrew before it was written in Greek, especially the New Testament, obviously, because there's figures of speech that don't play out in the Greek language. We call them idioms. 
things that only make sense in Hebrew, which is telling us it was written in Hebrew first. Now, here's the fun part. In John chapter 3. Hey, hey could, Chris, hold on one yeah. second. I'm getting some sure. weird feedback from you. Say something right quick. Check one, two. Okay. Check one, two. I don't know if it's you or me. Um, guys, yeah. let me know in the chat if you guys hear that crazy sound coming through. And if it is, I just probably get you to uh, leave and come back front in that chat, maybe. Oh, yeah. You tell me what you want to, want me to do. Okay, it was just I give one second. Hit my pause button. Yeah, I'm hearing some crazy sounds. Let me um. Let me know in the chat, guys. Let me see if I can hear it. Well, the importance of it okay, is Okay, I this. don't think it's you. Keep going, though. Keep going. You should be good. I don't think it's you. I think it's me. Okay. Keep talking. You sure? <laughs> wow. This is very strange. Hmm. Let me... That to know that you are God. Let me leave and come back. Say something one more time, please. Check one, two. Okay, we're Check good. One, it two. fixed. That was insane. Everybody, and I just looked in the chat and everybody's talking about electricity in the <laughs> chat. And then now we got, zzz, like, it was just insane. Very, very strange. Like, I'm looking in the chat. Everybody's talking about electricity. It's crazy. Yeah. It was on my end, though, but I've never had that happen. Wow. Yeah. Well, all right. So you want me to keep going? Yeah. We the good? spirit, the feminine aspect of the, of, of yeah. the mother. All right. So in John chapter three with Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he's and he's and he's asking him questions. Remember, he comes to him in the middle of the night because he doesn't want anybody to know. And he, and Jesus says to him, You have to be born again. Nicodemus says, How can I enter into my mother's womb a second time and be born again? Which is a really good question. That happens to be the first moment in John's gospel that Jesus utters the word spirit. And these are two Jews talking to each other. They're not going to be talking in Greek. He's going to say Ruach. And so Nicodemus says, how can I enter into my mother's womb a second time and be born again? And Jesus says to him, you must be born of water and of Ruach in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Nicodemus says, how do I go into a mother's womb? And Jesus says, Ruach. In other words, you have to be born of the waters. That's your that's your mortal birth through the through the waters of your mother's womb, you know, when yeah. her water breaks. And you must be born of Ruach, of the spirit. And, and so he's relating this mother concept again. Then you've got all of the words that Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to send you the comforter that's going to lead you into all truth. And that word helper is the same word that God uses with Adam when he says, I'm going to create for you essentially the woman. He says, I'm going to make for you the helper. It's almost like it's the Bible's code word for woman in this case. So we have this, this comparison here. Then there's that scripture that I think is both, um, it's hilariously scary. It's that one where Jesus says, if anyone blasphemes, me or the Father, they're going to be forgiven. But if anyone blasphemes the Holy Spirit, they will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. If we were to understand the identity of the Holy Spirit as a mother, that scripture makes so much more sense because it really is Jesus saying, you can say whatever you want to say about me. You can say whatever you want to say about dad. No one, no one talks about mom. She doesn't defend herself. We defend her. Yeah. And she is this image of holiness and purity that you do not curse if you were to see her. And then that's what it's a blasphemer. You'd have to actually see the Holy Spirit as a holy mother and then curse her. And I think that's why Jesus is going, if you if you can do that, then we're going to kick you out. <laughs> you, know, like we're gonna, you don't get to stay in the house. You know, yeah. like you're going to have to go take a big time out until you're ready to come back in, you know. Anyway, all that to say, there's all of these nods to it, but here's probably the biggest one. In Genesis, when Adam and his wife are created, it says that they're created in God's image. Image in Hebrew is reflection. 
And it's not just reflection like in a mirror. It really is a perfect 3D representation of the original. That's the language. So when it says in Genesis 2, in God's image, he created them male and female. The only explanation for that is that when God looks in this mirror, God has to have seen one man and one woman sharing the force of one life. Because if you remember Adam, God did not create a separate human to be with Adam. He took the Adam and separated Adam out into these opposite genders. Was, I mean, before Adam is sort of like containing all of them. And it's the only part of a perfect creation that God says isn't good. If you notice that, like he just got done saying, let there be, it is good. Let there be, it is good. He gets to Adam and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Mm. In other words, it is not good for Adam to contain both parts in and of himself. So he takes Adam and separates out from the one life, two autonomous people of opposite gender. And it says, in God's image, he created them male and female. In other words, in God's reflection, when God looks in the cosmic mirror, God saw one man, one woman sharing the force of one life, which to me means there has to be an aspect of God that is personifying that woman that is in that image that became Adam, you know, she's not called Eve until after the fall. So Adam, her and Adam, him, yeah. I don't know how you, I, what their names are, yeah. you know, but it's Adam, <laughs> him and Adam, her, whatever. No. So the Adam, her is a reflection of that feminine aspect of the Godhead, which I I'm pretty sure is being so clearly pointed to in the form of the Holy spirit, which is why Jesus would say, Nicodemus says, mom, Jesus says, Ruach. Jesus says, helper, woman, you know, Ruach. Like they're making this comparison. And then just a little fun moment here. When, when they do eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's like that reflection is cracked, like the mirror gets cracked for the first time. And suddenly Adam, her, and Adam, him are doing something different than the Godhead is doing. And it says in that moment that God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, looking, and they're like hiding in the bushes you know, because they're ashamed suddenly, you know, we hid because we were ashamed. We yeah. were afraid. Well, it says that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The, the phrase, the cool of the day does not exist in, in the text. It says God was walking with Ruach. And so if you can see that passage, it's so familial. It's father and mother walking in the garden to check on the kids. Remember, there's supposed to be a reflection. Man and woman Godhead reflecting man and woman on the earth, but the reflection was broken. Now the translators rendered it cool of the day, but it's not like in Hebrew, it says cool of the day. It just says Ruach, wow. which if we understand as the Holy Spirit, not as again, not as a holy pet dove, not as the holy strange uncle that no one understands. But if we're just following the trend through the ages God keeps presenting an identity that, that gets more and more familial with every step. So it was God is the father of a nation. Now God is a personal dad and there's a son. And now we've introduced the Holy Spirit, which is a bit of a mystery. And now we're starting to see maybe it was tucked away in there because it's waiting on this moment. And now all of this terminology about the end of the age being like birth pains like there's something being born. And now we're starting to see that maybe like for us to be in the spirit for these last two millennia, it's almost like we're in utero. We've been in the Holy Spirit. That scripture that says those who are in the Holy Spirit go where the spirit goes, as if you were inside a womb. So naturally, wherever that mother goes, you go. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many parallels here about the state that we've been in. And people ask, well, how we, how come we've never seen this immortal mother? Well, we've been in her in my experience. Like we've been in the spirit all of all this time, gestating, waiting for this moment of birth where we are, we come out of the womb with immortal bodies to match our immortal spirit. And so there's something about this playing out even at the end of the age and, and it being compared to labor pains yeah. as if the mother is about to birth us 
And what does a baby look on as soon as they come out? The first thing that they get to see is the mother. Why haven't we seen the Holy Spirit as a mother? I suspect it's going to be the first thing we look on with our immortal eyes is to see the immortal mother that we have been gestating in for two millennia since we were reconceived in the Holy Spirit. To be born again, you know, to a Hebrew birth is conception. So to be born again is to be conceived again, to be conceived anew, you know, as a new creation. And we're just waiting for this moment when all the parts come together and this body that we're supposed to inherit is also revealed. Now, no one has to believe me on that. That is not like a, you get a gold star if you believe that. That's not the way that this works at all. I personally think it's at least worth a conversation that if we're following the trends of the ages, we keep getting more familial with, with the Godhead. And if we've got a Holy Father and a Holy Son, I feel like there's only one logical missing link there in that perspective. And just on a personal note, I don't know how women have made it all this time, especially in, in, in the church. If, if you're not also made in God's image, you know what I mean? It's almost like, well, all, if all of God's parts are male, then in whose image was woman made? You know, if all of God's parts are androgynous in some way, then in whose image are men and women made in, you know? But it's right there in Genesis 2 that in his image, he created them male and female. In his reflection, he created them as a man yeah. and as a woman. All right, that's all. Go, go yeah. for it. No, wow. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions in and out of that and a lot of responses, too. Um, talking about uh, the Holy Spirit being the, the woman aspect, obviously, calls the spirit of wisdom as well, which is the word Sophia. Right. That's a yes. feminine a feminine aspect as well. We've always seen it like God is the one who kind of disciplines you, like the father will discipline you when you get in trouble. But the mother mm. is more of the nurturer. Like, I know dad, yeah. dad got onto you. And but you know what you did was wrong. And let me nurture you and let me love on you. So the Holy Spirit being the, yeah. the motherly aspect. Um, then again, there's a couple of different questions. I want to make sure I finish one without the other. What do you yeah. um think about you talk about do you think that that could have been maybe relating to the, the the masculine and the feminine within adam at the same time because you're talking about how she, she's not called eve until much later i know at the end of genesis 5 um mm-hmm. it, it says that god created uh man and woman and he called them Adam, yeah. meaning the Adamic yeah. man, right? Yeah. Um, and it says, in it's in another verse is kind of w- w- weird. Um, Gnostics talk about the hermaphrodite, yeah. which is I'm not even going to get into that. But oh, I hear you. Yeah, but there's the like Gnostic it, duality. Yeah, yeah, but there's this inward, uh, the yin and yang, both sides within us, and it, it says he created them, male and female. Like, yeah. like we have the male and female within us, the feminine and the masculine. And then yeah. out of that is another helpmate that is the personification. Does that make sense at all? Is that something to kind of? Well, absolutely. Into? I mean, I think, you know, we're designed to be able to experience both of those things, but expressed in a gender, right? You know, so, the, so it, there's never a case for, you know, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you as a man or you're not relating to the father as a woman, right? So you do have those influences coming in no matter the gender. But it seems so interesting that to me, when he says it's not good for man to be alone, it's almost like everything was made perfect. And the lone exception was those two genders were existing in an unseparated form inside of Adam. And so God's like, that's the only thing about this that isn't a reflection of me. And so you're close, but you're not it. And so let me see if I can find a helper for you. And so God brings, uh, you know, it says in the scriptures, he brings all the animals like in front of Adam to find a helper. I don't think it says animals. I think that Hebrew word is living creatures, which would be like cherubim and seraphim. Like Mm -hmm. he's bringing all the angelic world to Adam and going, are any of these helpers, which to (laughs) me makes more sense than if like Adam's in the garden and the Lord's like, Hey, Look at the giraffe. 
you know, like you like, you like yeah. the giraffe, you know, and Adam's like, no, no, it's not doing it for me. Okay. How about the peacock, you know, yeah. peacock, you know, do the thing with the feathers, you know? <laughs> you know, like, no, that's not working. Okay. Bring the aardvark in, you know, that doesn't make much sense. But if God is bringing in front of Adam, who again is a reflection of the Godhead, these living creatures, like these cherubim that would be around the throne and going, you know, these are the closest things to me around the throne. Do these work for you? And still Adam's like, no, none of these are suitable helpers. And so God goes with him, the only solution is to make you exactly like me. So that the Godhead is separated out into these persons, which we believe in our kind of Trinity understanding that these are autonomous beings that are sharing the force of one life, that you can't separate them out, but they are autonomous. You know, they are individual yet together. And it's almost like he's going, Adam, I have to separate you out just like the Godhead is separated out so that there's one life force and these two autonomous beings expressing the opposite genders. There's something about that that seems to reflect the Godhead so purely and perfectly. And you mentioned the Gnostics with their view that in order to be like God, you'd have to transcend gender because their view of God is like whatever mankind is, God has to be the opposite of that. <laughs> Touch not, so if, taste not. Right. So if man has gender, God must have. Ha- God must transcend gender, and be that hermaphroditic kind of strange thing that you were mentioning. And that's that's the Gnostic thing that Paul was fighting against so much. Was he's trying to tell Timothy in those letters to keep the wall up against that kind of Gnosticism, because again, their view of God was. Whatever man is, God must be the opposite. So if man has opposite genders, God has to be like that weird, I don't know what what it is, a a transgender. Yeah, and and then you move into where we are now. And this is why I think it's it's so timely for the the sovereignty thing that I'm putting out. And I'm starting to hear more people on it. I I talked about this with somebody the other day, but I'm blown away because... I've been researching and got the scriptures and this way I see God with the whole sovereignty issue of God is over all of it. And, uh, and anything bad is of the devil. It's not good or whatever the case. So I say, look, God is in all of it. He's in the trees. He's in, he's in everything. God is in all of it. All the the Lord is one. I was watching TBN the other day, I believe it was. And it was a, uh, a rabbi on, and he began to to share the message that God has been giving me over the years. And I, I mm-hmm. heard him pretty much like going through my notes. And I'm like, man, yeah. I've never heard anybody in this guy speaking it on TV. So, but yeah. it's the whole thing of just understanding that all of this stuff works together in this spiritual ecosystem under God is over and sovereign over it all. Because the Gnostic be- belief is the fact that there's two different gods and Yahweh was a bad God of the old Testament. And the God of the new Testament is another God who overthrew Yahweh. And I have some Christian friends who are getting into that stuff. And I'm like, no, you guys need to understand God's sovereignty. And they're like, well, a good God doesn't allow this to happen or a good God won't destroy a nation or whatever. I was like, man, you guys got to understand the umbrella and the sovereignty of it all. Cause if you don't, and you're getting into the seeking process, you're going to get into some other texts and, and people are, they're looking at, they don't even touch the Old Testament God. They don't, all yeah. those scriptures and they, they think that was a different God. And it's like, hold on, yeah. man. So we definitely have to have that, that conversation about that. I hear you. Yeah. Um, what about, so this, this is a view that I have. Um, yeah. The divine mother to me is definitely the Holy Spirit, but there's yeah. another aspect of the hand of God, the God of creation comes down and sticks his finger in the earth yeah and creates us out of mother nature or mother earth and that's why we have a connection that we come out of the earth being the mother does that make any sense in your realm man my wife and i were just talking about this that every culture in like the history of the earth that saw god as masculine looked up to the sky Every culture that saw God as feminine looked down to the earth. And it's, I mean, to me, obviously, it's like the answer is yes, right? (laughs) Father up, mother down on the earth, but either way. And then the fascinating thing to me is when we talk about the resurrection of the dead, where are the dead rising from? It's like they're popping up out of the earth, out of that mother's womb. 
but they've also been born from above. So you've got father doing the conceiving and you've got mother doing the birthing. I, I would not at all be surprised if built into our world is a metaphor for even us coming into resurrected life, that you had to be reconceived of the father and reborn of the Holy Spirit. And that's taken obviously two millennia at least, you know, I'm hoping it's soon, but two millennia at least for us to gestate. But whenever we talk about a resurrection of the dead, you know, even if you're born from above, which you are scripturally, it's not like we talk about the dead descending from heaven, you know, like when Jesus comes on the cloud and the dead in Christ will descend from heaven first. That's not how it's written. It's and when Jesus appears, the dead in Christ will rise first, that they're coming from this earth mother paradigm as if they're popping out of the womb, so to speak, you know, like they're being born in that moment. So I, that's a fascinating world to start to look into, especially ha, as cultures have seen it through the ages. And I know, I mean, this isn't a stretch for you, all the topics that you've covered on your show, but there's so many things I think God has spoken to cultures all around the world. And Christians, I feel like have just, it's like we always throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're so afraid to look at what, you know, someone has said in, in some Persian uh, you know, uh, paradigm, some, some historical philosopher from Greece or something that, that a Hindu has said at some time, and, and we're afraid to read it or to listen to it. But my thought has been, just because you're not all right, doesn't mean you're all wrong. You know? <laughs> yeah. Just because you didn't have the Holy Spirit guiding you didn't mean you didn't hit gold at least one time in your journey, because I think God's talking to anybody that's listening. And so, I mean, it, it, it seems like even looking like in a comparative religion sort of way, I've never been afraid of that because I always feel like God comes out on top. <laughs> like sure. You can't ever compare cultures and religions and somehow God is diminished. It's yeah. always raised up and you always are like, man, that's even better than I thought it was. You yeah. Know? It sounds like a breakthrough yeah. for you because it definitely was for me to see that. Yeah. Um, my thing with now is like, you know, God told us the scriptures tell us to judge people according to their fruit and it says yes. you will know that they are my disciples by their love it didn't say that you'll know them i know people even yesterday i had a comment and i come out of this sect but they said you they pretty much said you'll know that they're my disciples by their skin color and there's oh. a there's a lot of people who believe that you will know that they're my disciples by which version of the bible that they have, or even if they carry a Bible, you know, but it, yeah. it transcends. I think God transcends, sends all of that. And I believe that God is willing to deal with all of mankind as long as here's, I think there's one thing is that they'll repent of their sin, that they will turn from their wickedness and, and yeah. look up to the sky or look within and say, God, I need you. I can't do this yeah. on my own. What are you? And so that's where Jesus comes in, right? Um, there's There was this piece that came to me because Christianity has told us that we are peculiar people. We're different. We need to always have that magnifying glass to make sure that we're different and study what makes us different. And we say, yeah. okay, we're not that because we don't pray like that. We're not like these people because we don't worship like that or whatever. But I started looking at these other people groups um, and, and, and they have the same thing within them. They're seeking after God or something outside themselves, something greater. And they're very similar to what I'm doing. And um, there was a peace that came to me once I started to just look at these other people and see what made us the same. Okay, what makes yeah. us the same? I've, I've studied what makes us different. But what makes us the same that I was always right and this is the only way and you guys are in darkness and you need to repent and come to my church. I didn't have a church to go to anymore. I'm just checking them out. and say, OK, this is what makes us the same. And you, when you do that, man, and it, it opens up to a whole new world and a whole new realm, not to embrace their practices or their right or whatever, but just to listen to people. And just, yeah. to, man, it's called syncretism is to understand what makes us all the same. And there's a, we have a lot more in common than people know. I hear that. Yeah. So, man, I don't know how long we've done my, uh, the internet cut off probably about two hours in or an hour or something. in. now it says an hour <laughs> and 44. So let's see, we've done almost three hours. 
I, I yeah. enjoyed every minute of it, and I can keep going, but we'll save some for next time, dude. I'll have yeah, you back on. Uh, everybody seems to enjoy it because if they've been here this whole time with us hanging out, I'm reading the comment section. People are loving it, bro. We'll have to do it again. Go ahead and, and plug your material, man. Where can people – you got a bunch of stuff on your website, audio downloads, yeah. CDs, teachings, books, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Where can people find out more about your work at? Let me do that, and let me just say – for the sake of it being on the recording too, about all the things that we talked about today. And I know that you feel this way too. I, you know, we mentioned this when we were talking about the Holy spirit as a mother, I don't, you know, nobody's getting any gold stars because they're agreeing with me, you know, like it, it really is about relationship here. And I just hope in, in a large sense that it just starts conversations, you know, and that the, and like what you brought out so many times that we're just testing the fruit, and the fruit, if it's good, let's keep going. And in a transition in cosmic ages, we're going to have to be comfortable speculating a little bit and trying out new ideas and having conversations that are really mature about those new ideas as we're kind of discovering what we're coming into. So just yeah. as a as a closing note, I really appreciate that about you and, and about the testing the fruit and kind of walking circumspectly and this crazy time that we live in right now as we're, as we're just, we're pursuing it and we're going to pursue it together. And if the ideas that we talk about and we speculate on, if they're going to produce good fruit, I bet they stick. And if they don't, we're going to toss them aside and we're going to improve on them. And we're going to, we're going to find out what God's saying in this next age that we're coming into and we'll get it worked out. So products, the shameless product placement <laughs> moment. I just love it. You know, you gotta, you gotta be honest about it. It's the shameless if, product. If it's good, it's good, man. Let us know right. the best stuff you got. <laughs> All right. Cause so, they're going to support you, bro. They're going to go check it out. Trust me. Yeah. So there, the website is discover the heavens.org. It is a blessedly neglected website. And so uh, we just have not put a lot of attention into it, but there are products on there. There's all kinds of books in there. Not just ones that I've written to just books that I think people would be blessed to read. Uh, they're in the library section. Um, there's links on there. If you click those books, it'll send you to where you can find these things on Amazon. And then I've got some audio CDs as MP3 downloads on there too, which really are just guided heaven trips, right? So it's just some ethereal music in the background and me walking the listener through experiencing the heavens and opening their eyes and letting the Lord lead them on that. And each little volume is different trips, you know, awesome. it's not teaching. It's just going to heaven together. This is the first book I ever wrote. This is um, Caught Up in the Spirit, A Journey from Complacency to Glory. If you're interested in my dark night of the soul experience and the process of getting from like what I would think of as normal charismatic Christian life to starting to experience a life in the heavenly places, that's what this book is about. This was book number two. This is in the palaces of heaven. This was like the first couple years of getting to know the angelic realm. And this is a lot of how to at the end of like how to get your own eyes open. It's like some really like logical do this now do this now do this kind of thing. Kind of like the CDs, the audio CDs are set up at the end of this book, but a lot about the angels in here. And then this is the book that gets me in the most trouble. <laughs> this is cosmic <laughs> shift, a new season of faith, which talks about the stars and the identity of the Holy Spirit, and it really just tries to present the argument, if we're coming into a new age, we need to get ready for really big shifts yeah. and lots of new ideas, and they're going to be unprecedented. It doesn't mean that all of them are going to be right. It's going to take a really mature, discerning group of people to start to step into that next age, if that's something that someone feels called to do. So this explains the firmament and the stars and all those things I was learning in my own heavenly journeys about that and about time and the story that we're in. And then kind of like, it's, it's theoretical. The last third of the book is theoretical. Like what might this next age be like? And what might we find out about God and about our commission in the next age? Those sorts of things. Talk a little it. bit about that cover right quick, because when you were going through the ages now, Jesus says, behold, I will be with you until the end of the age and the age to come. So he's yes. talking about a, a new age or a next age that is coming. Right. Yep. But you didn't you didn't go into any detail about the name of that next age. And I see you have the you have it on your cover there. Let everybody know what the next age is going to be. Well, that right there, that's the water bearer. 
which would be Aquarius. And so the age that Jesus brought us into was Pisces. The next age, astronomically speaking, would be Aquarius. The hippies weren't wrong. It is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. <laughs> Maybe the way they pursued it was wrong, but the idea that astronomically that is the next cosmic age is exactly right. It's a beautiful picture of a heavenly immortal person pouring out of their vessel an infinite flow of living water. And that term next age is my favorite uh, because new age, I feel like, brings up all kinds of connotations. Yeah. And truthfully speaking, it's not the new age. It is just the next age. Yeah. We've had these shifts going on since, since the story began, and we will never stop experiencing story. And these cosmic ages are just like chapters in this really big story. So we shift one, we turn the page to the next chapter in the story, and it's the next age. Yeah, and so so there you go. That's that's what's on the cover. Yeah, that next age. Do you think that that's going to be like the kingdom age? Do you think that that is the new Jerusalem is going to bring about the age of Aquarius as it is ascends upon Earth, or yeah, descends? I mean, yeah, this is just me speculating, right? So yeah. if if I gave a title to the story we've been reading for the last six thousand years, I'd probably call it the redemption of man. And if I just venture to guess on the title that we're about to start reading the story of for who knows how long, I would probably call that one the dominion of man. So definitely something about a kingdom age and about a, you know, a city coming down out of heaven, a, a certainly a, a, a new encounter with Messiah as the risen Lord, as a, as a coming king, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and kingship being demonstrated in us. I feel like that's the revelation of that next age is true human kingship, certainly in the person of Jesus, but also in the person of, of those who are in Christ. Good stuff, man. I really enjoyed this interview, brother. Thank you for coming on, hanging out with me. Everyone listening, wherever you are, if you're on the podcast, if you're uh, listening on YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are, make sure that you guys support his ministry and what he's doing. Let him know that you heard him on this podcast and let us know in the description, in the comment section, if you'd like to have him back on, if you'd like for us to do another one of these talks and we'll make it happen. Let us know. We're listening to you guys. Chris Carter, Thanks so much for hanging out, brother. We, I'm, It was a blessing. This is our first time talking, ladies and gentlemen. I've been looking forward to having this conversation for a while, but it went really well, and I can't wait to build with you in the spirit of Christ, man. Good stuff. That was my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed every minute of it, and I feel like we, we could talk for about eight more hours without stopping. <laughs> I'm scared. You know, I, 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 let me be honest. Let me be honest. I'm scared that you're going to come back later and be like, hey, man, you got to take this episode down. I put out too much information on your oh. <laughs> podcast. You know, like that's how I've done it. OK, I've done it yeah. to people. I've done interviews. I'm like, OK, I probably shouldn't have said that. Can you remove it? But because we went deep, man. I know it's no, normal we're, we're stuff. And you love you love talking about it. We all do, man. And I think the audience does as well. Again, I don't know how long we've almost three hours or so. And if they're listening this long, man, it's something that uh. That that, that that grabs them and something that they identify with. So it's been good stuff, bro. We'll do it again, man. God bless you, bro. Yep. And I'll talk with you soon. You bet. Shalom. Peace. Chris Carter, ladies and gentlemen. Good show. I loved it. And I've been telling y'all, man, like the show's I'm I'm doing my own study, my own research. The people that I have on, man, who are just about the father's business, man, and they come in with that intention and like man we we could we literally probably could have went i'm gonna pull a joe rogan and do like a six hour podcast with somebody it's got to be somebody good but in order to do that there has to be uh, having all things in common not all of our doctrine all of our theology all of our experiences we'd be that'd be silly to think that we've both had all the same encounters now we've had a lot and that's refreshing that's beautiful because I haven't had many of this these talks with people, but having all things in common, man, and we could just go and go and go. And I really want to book more people like that, man. I want to book more people who get it. You know, one thing about the spiritual community, when I have people on, there was a lady I had on, Nora, the other day, and we did a uh, episode. And the episode was about animals, the language of animals and things like that. So we started talking about it, and I was like, okay, I just, I, you know, not really into it. We're going to discuss it and go through it together. So we talked about that 15, 20 minutes. The rest of the two and a half hours was about engaging God through the Holy Spirit and moving in the prophetic when we pray and things like that. And it would just blew my mind. 
people you wouldn't even expect that God has placed in different areas who know him, who stand for righteousness, who stand for truth, and they know Christ. You know, and to, to find those people to have on here, man, I love it. You know, not religious, not dog, dogmatic, but they really are about in, engaging uh, God through relationship, engaging heaven. They know who they are in the spirit and they believe in that and they believe God at different levels of faith. I love it. I want to have more people on. If you guys know any researchers, any preachers or whoever they are, man, that are, that just get it right. They get it, man. Send them my way. If you if you got a story, man, you want to come on and hang out and talk. Let me know. Get in my inbox, man. I want to make it happen. I got a, a bunch of big names reaching out to me, to be honest, but there I don't really I don't really want to talk about some of this stuff anymore that we've just kind of reiterated over and over and over. You know, I've talked about it in the past, how some of this stuff just gets redundant and I almost loathe doing the episode sometimes. But when it's something that you build within the spirit, man, it is it is living water, man. We we build up one another in the spirit. I'm refreshed. You guys are refreshed. I get I get the messages in the inbox all the time. So, man, I want it to be fun for me, and I want to keep that up. So anybody who knows anybody like that, send them my way. Um, the age of Aquarius, man. I was making sure he wanted to kind of go into that right there at the end. The next age is the age to come. I actually did a song called The Age of Aquarius. Uh was pretty much my first, like, really deep spiritual song. It was at the end of my album, That They May Know Him. And it was like through my awakening and research and stuff, it w- it came as the last uh, the last song that kind of transitioned me into more of this spiritual, um, esoteric language and doing my research a lot deeper. Um, for me, and I've been saying it, I'm going to keep saying it. It's very refreshing to to see Christians, to see believers who are unapologetic in their faith and they're having these beautiful encounters with God, with spirits, with elementals, with angels, with all of these lights in the sky. And they're just open, you know, they're just speaking it out because it's their truth. And they get that at the end of the day, it's their truth. You know, this whole thing that happened to me some years ago, I kind of, you know, left the church realm and, and did my studies and it was straight scriptural studies. And yeah, I read other books that were taken out, some philosophy, philosophy stuff, all that kind of things. But to see like God do, having this awakening across the globe that other people are going on. See, it's the plan of the enemy to let you think that you're the only one going through this. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands. Nobody's ever seen what I've seen. The, even the Messiah complex it gets into like, oh, I'm the only one that God is using. A lot of ministers are out there like that. Stay far away from them. But God is doing an in, inward work. This awakening is just not your personal awakening. It's global, man. And so if people are looking into these other st- subjects, people are looking into Gnosticism, people are looking into the stars and the cosmos, and who better to, to explore this and to talk about it but the sons and daughters of the Most High? Because if you don't answer these questions, pastor, preacher, whoever you are, if you don't, the new age will. They want to know how the cosmos works. If you don't hear it from a, a believer, they're going to look it up and they're going to come to the work of David Wilcock. They're going to find Corey Good. They're going to find all of these people who, you know, could be charlatans. You don't know. But we have to be open and honest about our faith and about our experiences and about our beliefs, not to tout them over one another. Well, I, tra- I, I travel to heaven. Well, I tra- tra- travel to the Pleiades. Well, I travel dra- straight to the God's heart as soon as I close my eyes, like, you know, just lording it over people. But just to, to talk about it in testimony format, to let you guys know that what is available for us, these encounters, you guys can have them as well. And then having other people on who have had encounters that I haven't even heard of, that I didn't even know were possible, what it looks like. It's different for everybody. So for me to be in a realm of Christians and believers who are now talking about the stuff that I've been talking about for years, um, I'm able to kind of use more of the biblical language and and they get it. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what I've studied. And it's just a breath of fresh air to be around Christians, to be around believers who actually get it. Right. Who aren't going to judge you, who aren't going to gossip and backbite and all that kind of stuff. It's awesome. It's refreshing. At the same time, it's a little bit scary. You know how they are. They're going to do you like they did you last time. Stay away from the church, folks. So, you know, and so there's always that caution, like, let me be careful, because if you really see me, 
if you really know who I am, you're going to run far away just like you did last time. That's always there. I know I'm not, I'm not the only one going through that. That's why I'm vocalizing. You guys are too. Stay away from church, folks. They only want this. Church people only that. I've said it a million times. It's like a, it's pros and cons in, in every uh, area and arena with that, man. But it is a little scary. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing more Christian podcasts and Christians are reaching out to me. They want to hear my story, you know, and things like that. It is a, it is a little scary, but refreshing at the same time. There's a group of people, again, Gil Hodges, Karina, Berlin, uh, everybody that we're affiliated with, man, there's some people who are really open about this stuff and they're believers and they're doing their own thing. And uh, we've kind of come together and we're talking about this stuff and sharing ideas and how we can work together and promote and things like that. Just get our message out there and grow together in unity and really be there for one another, not for what we can get, but what about what we can bring to the table to help one another. And um, as we're doing that, it's, it's, it's blowing my mind, you know, finding believers who, who, uh, are, are meeting with you and stuff. So we'll share my podcast in, in the different groups. And there's only certain ones that, you know, you can share. You're not going to probably share my Jordan Maxwell interviews and stuff like that. That's understandable. I wouldn't either, but they're sharing my stuff and we're growing together in the spirit. Um, but then like, it's um crazy. Cause I'll see them in other groups, other Christian groups on Facebook, and I'll be like, okay, let me share my interview in that one. And there's a beautiful Christian interview. The, even the interview I just did with Karina, which is phenomenal, one of my favorite episodes. Um, I shared that in a group, a Christian group. And these other groups were like, oh, this is beautiful, man. You guys are speaking my language. God is in this episode. I, I feel the Holy Spirit the whole time while I'm listening to your conversation. Beautiful comments, right? Shared in this other Christian group is a group called Canary Cry. And I guess it's a Christian apologetic podcast or something. I'm not sure. But I shared it in there. And I came back a few days later and and looked at the comments. And there was like 10 comments. And they all were like ripping me apart. Like, oh, these people are New Agers. And the Fringe Radio is now letting new agers come on their show and it was just like all of this stuff that wasn't of god and i'm glad i left the charismatic movement the charismatic movement is this and i was like "Uh oh okay let me delete this out of this group y'all don't y'all shouldn't be privy to this let me just delete this out of the group and but it was a reminder to be careful watch out some of they can be they can be man they can be ravenous wolves man you got to be careful you know um having a platform and sharing stuff you kind of put yourself out there for open scrutiny like even people will jump in the comment section and just post inappropriate things and rebukes and all kind of just weird stuff that goes on but it's all a part of it i'm excited about the future i'm excited about what the lord is doing in in my circle and in in the midst of, of me and my community and, and my friends and uh it's just beautiful to just see god elevate people uh god awaken people through encounter with him not responding to a doctrine not responding to Hey, this was my encounter seven years ago. Believe my words. I know God wants to encounter you where you are right now, you know, and um, Chris Carter's doing it. It's so beautiful to see him on his journey and studying the stars and the cosmos and, and prayer and angels. And about the same time, I'm doing my thing. I'm going out and I'm studying the stars. And I'm having encounters and revelations. And then here it is, 2019, we're coming together and we're like, OK, here it is. Like it or not. Here it is. You know, it's like, wow, God's prepping these people up, prepping you up, teaching you things that you're not going, You there's no way you could have learned where you were 10 years ago, eight years ago. You wouldn't have learned it there. You had to kind of go through some things. You had to learn. You had to receive that fire to, to purge uh, all of those things out of you and off of you that were there. And it's for good reason. It's because he loves you. He uses circumstances and situations to do that, and it's because he loves you. There's things that I had in me some years ago, bitterness and unforgiveness, that if I was to be at this level now, there's a, what we call self-sabotage. And there's, you know, we see, I always point to Roseanne, you know, Roseanne like undid her entire career in one tweet, one lashing out, one friend that ba backstabs you, one person that stabs you in the back, one comment that you respond wrong to, then it's screenshot it and it's posted everywhere. There's things that you can do to un undo the work that you've been doing, but we serve a good God. This whole hammering process, the sanctification process, God knows what he's doing. The Lord knows what he's doing and he's the best one to do it. The Bible says that he is the author 
and finisher of our faith. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, he's there, man. Like Chris Carter says, God, where are you at? Jesus, where are you in this? I don't see you. I need to see you. There he is. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's always there. But you just got to see him. See where he is in it, in the whole situation. I've went through deliverance ministry, uh, and it, it done wonders for me um, years ago. Um, it was like my come to Jesus was was powerful, set me free of so many things. Um, but then there were still other things that kind of latched on generational curses, unforgiveness and things like that. And this deliverance allowed me to kind of go through that and deal with some of the other things that were lingering in my mind and in my spirit. And we dealt with that and got rid of it. And the whole thing of how deep and how crazy a deliverance and casting out of demons and imaginations and strongholds as deep and esoteric as that is. It was as simple as going through writing down some really traumatic things that happened to me and just saying, OK, and the people would ask me, where do you see Jesus in this? Okay, he's there. And asking him to heal, to forgive the person, walking in healing and forgiveness. And this is how simple it was. Where do you see Jesus in it? And so the message of this podcast has always been, where, do you, where where's Jesus? You know, all of the music, encountering God through these different levels, man. There's just so many ways to do it. There's so many levels, and, and it's just beautiful on every one, and I respect all of them. I really do. And it's all about the fruit at the end of the day. Creating encounter. Encountering God. You guys, the, my ministry name that I've been under is Encountering God Ministry. Um, the meditations, the music, it's all about creating encounter. And it's working. It's good stuff, man. Let the Lord use you in whatever you're doing. What, let them use you, man. Whatever it is, see, in this sanctification process, there's things we got to go through, there's things we got to let go of. Most of us already know it. Not every time, but most of the time we already know that God has spoken something to our hearts that we got to get rid of. There's something we have to say. There's someone that we have to forgive. And once we do that, then breakthrough will come. Whether you're in a relationship you shouldn't be in, whether, for me, I was in a band that I wasn't supposed to be in. You know, and there's different... God, this is a personal walk, man. The Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that inner sanctification process is between two people, you and God. And don't let nobody speak into you who have ill intentions. Don't let people speak into you who don't understand what God has called you to. They don't know. They haven't sought the Lord in tears. They haven't been through that stuff. Don't allow them to speak into your, your destiny and your future and try to rob you of that. But understand that the things that God has placed within you, the good work and that which he has started, he will also finish. That's a promise. That's a universal law. God will finish the things in which he started within you. Believe it. Receive it. Walk in it, man. God has great and mighty things for you in store that you do not know and you cannot find out unless you draw away unto him and get in, get into his mind, receive the mind of Christ. Chris Carter talking about ascending to heaven. God, where are you? What would you say? I want to know these things that you've told me. There's a bunch of ways to do that. We engage God in all of the mystical means. God is a mystical experience. The mystery of Christ is a very mystical experience. I uh, talked with a brother yesterday. He didn't really understand um, you know, some of the other movements of people trembling and crying and shaking and all of the manifestations that go on. And I simply told him this, like, and there's a lot of people, even in those other Christian movements who will say, you're getting into emotionalism. You guys are just being emotional, right? Yeah, we are. When you have a person who has a, a whole life of sin, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and in an instant, they're washed clean of all the baggage that they've been carrying, all the dirt that they've done. And in an instant, it's taken from them and they've washed with the blood of Christ and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a very emotional encounter, man. I believe in that, man. Engage God. The things that you're carrying, the heaviness, if you need somebody to pray with you and pray through it, get with us. Get with myself, Chris Carter. We have a community set up. Read the description. We got Discord forms, all that kind of stuff. Look for your community. Find your tribe. There are people that you're looking for. They're looking for you as well. You're not alone. 
And as cliche as that sounds, so much power in it to let people know that you're not alone. We're taking taking that away. Peter, um, Jesus told Peter, look, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, to get you out by yourself. But but don't don't fear, don't be afraid. Jesus said, for I have prayed for you. And just as Satan has desired to get Peter out by himself, that Satan desires to get us out by ourselves, confuse us, tell us ungodly beliefs, believe the lie of the enemy, believe the, the lie of the people who don't understand you, the people who spoke out evil against you and all those things. And you begin to be- believe their report. You got to get into scriptures, man. Again, it's as you are beholding yourself as you're looking within a mirror to see who you really are, the higher self, the person that God has created you to be. It's found through intimacy with the Father. With that being said, I'm going to say thank you guys for hanging out with me. Uh, thank you, everybody, for supporting my work um, at the dollar level. Um, all of my music, 200 songs. The access to them. Patreon.com backslash Truthseeker. See you guys on the next one. Peace and shalom, guys. Let's do it. Yo, so much higher than mine, so much higher than mine, so much deeper than mine, so much deeper than mine. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.